Welcome to Diplomatic Channel. I'm Amarachi Obani. The coup in Guinea continues to worry regional bloc echoers, which is right now in talks with the leader of the junta, Colonel Mamadi Dumbuya. ECOWAS has suspended Guinea from the community and is already demanding a return to the civilian rule immediately. We'll be telling you more about what's going on. Our focus this week, however, is on 20 years since the terrorist attacks on American soil. The attacks just led the U.S. into what seemed like a never-ending war in Afghanistan, where the masterminds were supposedly trained. My colleague Maria Bird will be part of the show this week as she speaks to two individuals, one who was there during the attacks and the other who lost his father and had to step into responsibility he never thought he would be handling so soon. Both also express their thoughts on the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. That's Diplomatic Channel in a wrap. Let's check in another discussions in diplomatic circles, and we'll be right back. The Nigerian ambassador to Italy, the NITCOM chairman, and the Nigerian community in Italy are demanding a full investigation into the killing of a Nigerian housewife, identified as Rita Amenze in Italy. In a joint statement, the group says the woman's husband, Mr. Pierangelo Peliza, has been arrested over the incident as she was killed after asking for a divorce. Ambassador Mfoa Abam says the embassy has been informed of the killing and will ensure that proper investigation is carried out. The Indian High Commissioner has informed the Nigerian community in India that the Foreign Regional Registration Office has decided that foreign nationals with regular visa or e-visa and stranded in India because of COVID-19 may be considered as deemed valid until September 30, 2021. A letter from the government to that effect says foreign nationals would not be required to submit any application to the FRRO, but before exiting the country, foreign nationals may apply for an exit permission, which will be granted by the FRRO or the FRO on gratis basis, without levy or any overstay penalty. Iraq's Prime Minister and Iran's President have stressed the importance of strengthening ties between the neighboring countries. Iraq has been trying to mediate between Tehran and its Gulf Arab foes, including Saudi Arabia, in the hope of stopping its neighbors setting schools on its territory. Welcome back. As we said earlier, ECOWAS leaders have been in Guinea following its suspension of the country's membership. As a response to the military coup, the removed President Alpha Conde, whose whereabouts remain unknown, save that he remains in custody with the soldiers. The high-level diplomatic mission is expected to demand a return to constitutional order and call for President Conde's release. The ECOWAS delegation arrived in Guinea on Friday for the talks with leader of the military coup that removed President Alpha Conde. The envoys, including President of the ECOWAS Commission, Jean-Claude Cassie Brew, Burkina Faso's Foreign Minister, Alpha Barry, and Ghana's Foreign Affairs Minister, Shirley Ayoko Botchwe, held a closed-door meeting with Colonel Mamadi Dumboya and then visited ousted 83-year-old Conde, who was detained in a military camp. Conde, who had been in power since 2010, has been detained by the junta, the National Rally and Development Committee, since it staged the coup last Sunday. We have met with him and he looks very well. He was very open, very frank. We had very frank conversation, engagement. And like I said, we will go back. Um, what we discussed is not for public consumption at this point. We were asked to come. Uh, by the heads of state, and therefore we will go back and report to them. On Wednesday last week, ECOWAS suspended Guinea's membership, but stopped short of imposing further sanctions, saying it was waiting for the result of the mission to Conakry. The coup is the third since April in West and Central Africa. The latest in Guinea has intensified fears of a slide back towards military rule in the region, which had until recently been starting to shed its coup belt reputation. 
The self-installed military leader Domboya maintains he is acting in the best interest of the nation, accusing Conde's government of endemic corruption and of trampling on citizens' rights. He promises to install a transitional government of national unity, but has not said when or how that will happen. The coup in Guinea has sparked broad diplomatic condemnation, even from the United Nations and the African Union. Alpha Conde became Guinea's first democratically elected president in 2010 and was re-elected for a second term in 2015. His desire for a third term led to constitutional change, a move seen as illegal by his opponents. ECOWAS was criticized for remaining silent about Conde's third term, which would have allowed him to remain in power until 2030. And now we turn to the 9-11 attacks. It's been 20 years since the first terrorist attacks on America, and one the nation and the world refuses to forget. On the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, a tribute in light shines from the former site of the World Trade Center. At sunset, 88 powerful vertical searchlights projected twin beams four miles into the sky to mirror the shape of the fallen towers. The annual tribute in light public art installation was a culmination of a series of former commemoration events on Saturday, September 11. This year, buildings throughout Manhattan, including the Empire State Building and Lincoln Center Plaza, joined the commemoration by illuminating the facades in blue. Alongside other commemorations of the attacks, President Joe Biden visited each of the sites where hijacked planes crashed in 2001, honoring the victims of the devastating assault. At the Pentagon, the Bidings, Vice President Kamala Harris and Second Gentleman Doug Emhoff touched a memorial wreath at the Pentagon site where a series of benches have been erected representing each of the 184. Over in Afghanistan, Taliban fighters fault the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan after September 11 attacks did not bring peace and stability to the region and that the Americans did not achieve their goals. According to the Taliban general, the American goal was to topple China, Russia, Iran and all the countries of Central Asia instead of the former Taliban government in 2001, but they were unsuccessful. As for America's strongest ally, Britain, Prime Minister Boris Johnson said in a video message that the attacks failed to divide those who believe in freedom and democracy. While the terrorists imposed their burden of grief and suffering and while the threat persists today, we can now say with the perspective of 20 years that they failed to shake our belief in freedom and democracy. They failed to drive our nations apart, or to cause us to abandon our values or to live in permanent fear. A day after 9-11-2021, the FBI released a newly declassified document that looks into connections between Saudi citizens in the U.S. and two of the 9-11 attackers. It provided no evidence the Saudi government was linked to the plot. My colleague, Maria Bird, had a chat with two individuals who had two different experiences during the attack. First, we listened to Gail E. Mitchell, a retired employee of the Port Authority's real estate division, one of the survivors of the attacks. We know that you were one of those survivors of the World Trade Center attacks. Just tell us a little bit about what that day actually, uh, what it was like, how you felt, um, and how after 20 years you're remembering this day. So when I arrived at the Trade Center and I came up out of the subway, the security team at the World Trade Center said, oh, you have to exit this door. And I'm saying, why are they telling us to exit the door when I wanna go upstairs? 
So when I exited the door and I looked up at like everyone else, Tower One had been hit. And that's where I worked. I actually worked on the 88th floor of Tower One. As I exited the building, I looked up. I said, oh, my goodness, what on earth happened? Because, of course, I didn't have radio on or anything. And somebody said, oh, a plane ran into the building. I said, how could that be? It was gorgeous. It was beautiful. How could a plane not even see the building? We were standing on the corner where there's a post office there. So we were looking up like everyone else, and all of a sudden, Tower 2 was hit. And I said, oh, my God. Now I believed it, because I saw the plane. I saw it hit. We were all exposed to, I call it the rain of fire. What was the greatest impact on that day, on 9-11? What was kind of the greatest impact that you saw on that day? My experience that was most traumatic for me that day were seeing people make choices. The choices they made was to jump out of the building rather than burn to death. After you realized that building one had been hit, building two had been hit, what was the first thing that you thought to do to obviously preserve your life um, and also those who were around you? After building two was hit, we saw a young lady who was crying and we went to her and we said, we need, we, you, you need to leave with us. You need to get out of here. She says, no, I'm waiting for my mother to come out. My mother works here. I need to stay and see that she's okay. I said, you will not be okay. You may be killed if you stay here. So the three of us left. We all started running. And my thought was, I live in Queens. I need to go home. You, you, you go into survival mode. You're not yourself. You, you're, you're not the same person you were when you got up to go to work. You go into survival mode. You start thinking about and praying for all those people you knew, were your coworkers. I knew a lot of the security guards who worked in the building. I knew a lot of the operations people who worked in the building. Police officers who, who sacrificed themselves. I worked for, with, with many of them and I knew them. So it, it still, to this day, it feels like it happened yesterday. So tell us a little bit about, I mean, you described the day, but how has this day impacted the rest of your life for the past 20 years? What could you say was the impact that you had or things that have kind of just stuck with you these past 20 years? When you walk out of the door, you appreciate your family and your friends more. Because they don't have, you don't have to be there to appreciate them. They don't have to be there to appreciate you. A lot of people I speak to say the same thing because we were and some people weren't. So you want to make the best of whatever it was that you are supposed to do with your life because, yes, you were spared and you're here and you're here for a purpose and a reason. So, you know, those are some of the things I often think about and I still do. So we know that it's been 20 years. Uh, we know that we went directly into Afghanistan. We know that we began kind of this war on terror, right? What are your feelings about the withdrawal? I mean, having experienced what you did at the World Trade Center and remembering, I'm sure, the day when the troops entered Afghanistan, what is your feeling now that we've seen this withdrawal and kind of the way in which we withdrew from Afghanistan? I think we should have withdrawn. I do believe it was time. Um, we sacrificed so many lives there for a reason, but I thought it was time. Could it have been done differently? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not a, uh, I was never in the military. So in terms of, of their precision and all the things that they do, I don't know. But I know that they did the best they could. Um, we really appreciate your ability to share with us, and we appreciate you know all that you've done um, over these last 20 years, obviously, to share your story and to give people just a little insight into exactly what happened. Thank you so much. When we come back after the break, Maria speaks to Ray Sanchez, Jr., 
whose father died in the attacks, changing his life's course. Stay with us. Welcome back. Let's head back to Maria for her conversation with Ray Sanchez, whose father died in the attacks on the Twin Towers. Sanchez was still in his 20s and was already working in politics. 9-11 changed his life's course. But interestingly, he ended up being endorsed as candidate for New York City Council District 7 on June 22, 2021. Um, and we are here at 20 years after the 9-11 attacks. We know that you have lost someone very dear to you as a result of these attacks from 20 years ago. Can you tell us um, kind of what has happened these past 20 years? Um, how did this definitely change your life? You know, for most folks, 9-11, people forget that it was primary day, right? And, you know, I had worked for then mayoral candidate Fernando Ferrer for about, uh, about a year before moving on another job but you know I, I was primary day I was supporting the Ferrer candidacy and you know had you know but for 9-11 most political folks really believe Freddie Ferrer would have won that primary outright and avoided a runoff and you know the the political consequences of of 9-11 and 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 whatnot you know completely impacted my career trajectory I thought I was going to be 22 23 working in City Hall um, I ended up taking a year to clean up my dad's uh, estate issues, which took quite some time. Getting a death certificate took longer than it did for most people. Um, and to be 22 years old, to, to be the executive of the state out of college, um, uh, there was a lot of growing up real fast. Um, and because of it, you know, I made, you know, uh, choices, whether it was to go to law school or buy a house, you know, things that I was doing at 22 and 23 that I didn't normally wouldn't have been doing, but for the fact that my dad passed away and I was trying to figure out how to do the most responsible thing with uh, the, the funds received from the victim compensation fund, which in of itself was uh, a very arduous process for, for, for me and my family. Now your dad, was he in Tower One or exactly where was your father? Was he working actually? Who was so he my dad was a, was a union carpenter uh, working for a company called Soundtone Floors. And he had been at the trades, you know, my dad could have been anywhere that day. He, you know, his, his, his company sent him all over the place. They sent him to Connecticut. They sent him all over the five boroughs. They sent him to Jersey. Uh, but it just happened that my dad was on a big assignment at Aon, Aon Insurance, uh, you know, doing, you know, remodeling their offices and putting in new floors. And, um, and you know, and, and what's, what, you know, what doesn't get talked about once people don't know is that uh, my dad could have got, got, could have gone out of the building. Uh, it was that fact that he turned around to go look for his apprentice. Who he didn't, who he had lost contact with, and he didn't know where he was. That my dad got chopped in the elevators and and, and didn't make it out. Um, his his uh, the last person talked to him was his best friend, who was a, uh, Tony, who was a firefighter and and um, you know who was also a carpenter too, um, but but mostly a, a firefighter Woodside and and you know. You know, when I when Tony and I spoke the next day, he's like, "You're not getting remains." He's like, "I know. I was the last person to talk to your dad. He's gone." Um, and having to process that again at 22, 23 years old, um, you know, um, was a lot. Twenty years later, um, what does this mean for you, and how has this impacted your life? Have you done things differently? What does this 20th anniversary represent in your life? Um, you got to figure out what makes sense. You know, are you are you are you are you dealing with this uh, trauma in a positive way? And and it is a trauma. And 20 years later, it's still a trauma. Uh, not something I talk about a lot. Um, you know, every year, anniversary comes out, and maybe I'll post something, and you know, people come up to work like, "Wait, I didn't know." Because like, I don't talk about this. <laughs> you know, um, I, you know, I've done interviews here and there, um, but it's not something. And when, you know, when, when you're a family member, you know, like the vast majority of people, 9, 12, 9, 13, they go back to living their lives. Um, you know, this, you know, that stuff isn't, you know, this, the ceremonial stuff isn't really for us and on a lot of levels. Um, so that's why I think it's just so important to have perspective to figure out what is, what serves me, what's not serving me, what makes sense. It's important to have, you know, these, these, these benchmarks to say, all right, okay. Uh, cause 
reflection is 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 help is necessary to have you know you know um i don't want to say closure because i don't think you ever really get closure uh from something like this uh but to to get to deal with it in a healthy way so that one you're not defined by it and two you're um you're making forward progress which is always something that's very important to me Thank you so much for sharing that because, you know, as you said, the emotion, you know, and I, I remember the emotion. I was living in New York at the time in college and that just kind of the heartbeat that people go to New York for was just right. on that day. So thank you for being, because it's hard to go back, um, especially when you've had this type of loss. You know, we're now 20 I mean, years. Yes. I, I, I should also mention that I was there. Mm. I was physically there. I was coming off the four train at Wall Street when the first plane hit the buildings. I came up street side on Broadway and Wall and, you know, could see it was raining, burning paper. Like those people who, if you were there, you have very vivid memories of the things you saw. Um, and uh, it's a lot. It's a lot to 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 even 20 years later to think about those very vivid, very traumatic uh, visuals that happened that day. Yes, yes, and the smell was something you will never forget that, that smell. So, but tell us, you know, we're now 20 years, as we've said, and, but there was a war that happened as a result of this. And we're now withdrawing from this war. We've taken all the troops out of Afghanistan. How do you feel um, having, you know, gone through such great loss as a result of the 9-11 attacks? How do you feel about how we left Afghanistan and was that the right move? And are we still in, in potential terrorist threat mode at this time? So when it comes to Afghanistan, uh, there's a few things that, uh, to keep in mind. One, we were never, never meant to be there in perpetuity. Um, so it becomes, you know, at some point you have to figure out when to cut your losses. You can't have it both ways. You can't be frustrated with American interventionism, but then, you know, be mad and, and that when we when we finally do leave, like you can't have it both ways. You know, is it frustrating that, you know, um, we didn't leave Afghanistan better than we found it, right? You know, from an infrastructure perspective alone, they could have done some really great things in Afghanistan. Roads, bridges, infrastructure, right? Schools hospitals um for the billions if not trillions of dollars we spent over the last 20 years what do we have you know to show for it again 20 years um yeah i don't know where well, you know where in, you know whether in, in people's you know uh, professional lives right at some point you have to have a deliverable for what you spent your money on where are the deliverables what did we actually get done and if that's if we haven't really gotten much done we haven't endeared ourselves to the Afghanistan, Afghan, Afghanistan population. We haven't you know, done real significant uh, long-standing infrastructure pro projects that work, that actually make people's lives better. We haven't improved the schools. We have, so, so you know, this fear of, of, of you know, of, of, of perpetuating uh, extremism or, or what have you of Afghanistan, um, some things are going to happen regardless. Um, uh, and, and again, it's not get too political here, but the, you know, at reality, at some point you have to cut your losses. If you're not doing something well, what's the, what's the alternative, right? You know, I spent seven years in city government, um, uh, general counsel to a borough president, you know, trying to deal with, you know, issues, whether it's legislative or policy and, you know, people would come to me, you know, and I'd say, well, do you have an alternative? If you don't like this piece of legislation or you don't like this project, um, you can critique, it's easy to critique. What's your alternative? What's your solution? If you're not offering one, then anybody can complain. Ray, you've given us quite a bit um, from your experience, your loss. Thank you so much again. Thank you for having me. And that's Diplomatic Channel this week. Remember, you don't need big life events to appreciate life. Let's cause you to be kind to ourselves and to one another. I'm Amarachi Ubani. I'll see you next time.